Welcome to the next episode of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Um, we've made this migration away from just being an audio podcast to being a video cast. We still have the audio version for you podcasters, but if you want to see the visuals, go over to our YouTube channel. My guest this week is um, Gary Wolf, a longtime friend. Um, I'll ask Gary to introduce himself shortly, but um, I know Gary because many hundred years ago <laughs> he started Quantified Self. It was the past century. It was. <laughs> That's a long time ago. So, Gary, introduce yourself. Well, I'm Gary. Uh, I am a writer, a journalist, and also the founder of Quantified Self and uh, the director now of a nonprofit foundation called mm -hmm. Article 27, which we could talk a little bit about. It's uh, named after the uh, forgotten article in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that guarantees the right to participate in science. Um, and so uh, I am really interested in helping people learn about themselves using empirical methods. And I think we'll talk with some about, about some of that today. And um, Kevin, lead yeah. us. It's, it's, and, and Gary was, we actually met originally at Wire because Gary was one of our staff writers um, long ago. And um, we so did we some each other stories. All. Yeah. <laughs> then you wrote a book about Wire. <laughs> um, so um, Gary, tell us about some of um, the cool tools that you know about and want us to share with. What's the first one? Sure. Um, I'll start with one that's really right in the bullseye of the kind of thing people think about when they talk about quantified self. So quantified self is a user community, people who are interested in self-tracking, um, includes both makers and users of self-tracking tools and people who want to learn about themselves using um, their own data. And so the first thing that comes to mind when people think about quantified self is technologies that enable self-tracking. Um, it has a kind of techie vibe. Um, so I'll just share uh, one of these really neat tools for self-tracking to start with. And um, the idea with, with self-tracking is that you, um, you're kind of like performing an experiment on yourself in some ways. You are trying to collect some data. It's, we, we all pay attention to ourselves, but what if we could actually quantify it? That's the data part. Yeah, so we use exactly. some technology to generate numbers instead of maybe just an observation in our head. And that's the general principle. Yeah, exactly. And over the years, I mean, this we started this, Kevin, in 2007, and it's grown and changed, but I think it's, it's stayed true to the fundamental idea, which is new ways of observing change us in some way. So when right, you can right. see different things, you can think different things. And right. when you think different things, you kind of become something different. Sure, so sure. it's really, that's the quantified plus the self, right. you know, that makes quantified right. self. And, but you know, a lot so of- what's, So what's the tool that you- what's the Yeah, tool? here we go. Let's just, let's just share this. All right. So there's an arm with exactly. a little disc. It's a disc. And that's- Yeah, that's it... a disc. So that's a minimally invasive sensor. And um, it it's... just sticks to your arm like a little Band-Aid. Um, it's about the size of a half dollar or... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Smaller, a little smaller than a half like dollar. Like a quarter, maybe. Yeah. And um, here, I'll, I'll give you the other one now. Um, so you can see it in a hand and that gives you the uh, perspective. So right. that's the front of it, um, which is, you know, the part that you see uh, when you're looking at it on the arm. And the back of it, if you look really closely, right at the center, you'll see a tiny little metal spike. It's less than half an inch long, maybe a quarter inch. And that little spike sticks into your skin. So it's like a little needle. It's a little needle. That penetrates your skin. When you put skin. it on, you don't even feel it, but it's a little needle in there. Okay. All right. Now, so you have this, so you have this kind of a quarter size disc, very thin and gray. And then you, on one side is a little protruding, a little tiny tip of a needle that goes into your skin. Exactly. And then, and then it's ta taped on. Uh, it has adhesive. Okay. Yeah. It has adhesive and it's, waterproof you can take a shower with it and it's um lasts for about 14 days and i'll give you the name obviously you know and what's it notes. measuring so it's measuring your blood glucose okay so it's a glucose monitor okay now you might think wait that needle 
can't, can't possibly go into your bloodstream in any way, right? I mean, it's really, really short. How do you pick up blood glucose? Normally, what we do for blood glucose and people who are managing diabetes know this is you prick your finger and you get a little spot of blood, right? And, and then, you know, you uh, analyze that blood. This actually is getting the interstitial fluid in your skin, the, the fluid between the layers of your skin. And the makers of this device, uh, Abbott Labs, most people now know Abbott Labs because they also make uh, COVID tests. Mm -hmm. So if you've used those Binex COVID tests that come in the blue box, that's from Abbott Labs. But this is uh, something they created to support diabetes management. Right. They know how to take the, the information that comes from the fluid in your skin and turn it into information about the blood sugar. Okay. Um, it sounds like you wear one of these? So I, they are meant for, they have a number of different uses. Their main use is for diabetes management. And now I do not have diabetes, so I don't manage diabetes. Um, but I am interested in my blood sugar levels because they are related to your metabolic function overall. So if you have questions about your metabolism, things like, okay, um, why do I suddenly feel really hungry every day at, at you know 11 a.m. or uh, am I tired? Tired after lunch is that more than normal, right? Or mm -hmm. um, you know other questions like that. Or or have I been told or suspect that maybe I'm vulnerable to diabetes type two? So mm -hmm. maybe I'm developing diabetes. Um, right, right. These are all reasons you might be interested in your blood sugar, and for that purpose, you can wear it intermittently. Like for say two weeks, you learn what you can. Then, you know, after oh. you think for a while or have some new ideas you want to test, you can okay. wear it again. Do you need now, a doctor's prescription to get it? So in Europe, it's available over the counter. In mm. the United States, you need a doctor's prescription. Um, this is just purely like rent seeking from the, you know, healthcare system. Right. Could you buy one in Europe and wear it here? Abs uh, yes, you can. Um, but also, it's pretty easy to get a prescription. And there's okay. um, the last tool I'm going to show today, which is the, the QS forum. You can get advice about how to get them, and how to get a prescription. How do you get the easily. data out? Is it Bluetooth? So it talks to an app. Yeah, okay. so it has, it has um, uh, near-field communication. Okay. So it has a little battery in it. Yes, it has, it's powered. Okay. Yeah, but not enough, not so much battery. I mean, if you want to get into the technical details, there's, there's not the kind of battery you would need to run uh, like a always on Bluetooth connection or something like that. Okay, all right. So it is very, very low power. And so what, what approximately does it cost? <laughs> so the question of what they cost, of course, is um, a little bit hard to answer because in the United States, they're available only by prescription. So they ask for your uh, insurance. Uh -huh. And like anything in healthcare, um, it's hard sometimes to tell what's really right. you're going to end up paying. But um, I've paid under, you know, $100 for the two weeks of blood glucose measurement. Two weeks. Wait, 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 wait. But you say you could wear one for two weeks. You can wear one for two weeks. So I think I paid $40 for okay. the one that I wore. Okay. All right. But I don't know if that was subsidized in some way, right? So. Uh -huh. All right. This is the hard part. Okay. Um, so, um, so that's just one, th th that's one kind of thing, a device that you can wear to track you. There are, of course, Fitbits that do your motion and activities and other things. Um, and you mentioned some reasons why you might want to track that on your own. Um, was there something that you learned from it that changed your behavior? Yeah, I wanted to show you something that it was just kind of super interesting to me because one of the, the kind of key ingredients, the special ingredients about um, using a tool to make observations about yourself is developing good questions to ask because otherwise you just have data, right? And data has no meaning except in relation to the questions you ask. So. If you're wondering about your blood glucose, one of the things you want to do is understand, okay, well, what's typical and what's different? Mm -hmm. What's normal for you? What's normal for me? Mm -hmm. So here is um, the raw data. Mm -hmm. um, this is from, a, I just happen to have this easily available. So this is from a test I did um, a few years ago, showing my glucose levels coming off the device. And here you can see 
my average glucose, my average blood glucose in the morning before I get up is about 93, which is, you know, perfectly acceptable. Right. So, um, so yeah. one of the things um, that I've noticed about the quantified self is that some measurements, let's say like number of steps, I, I wore a Fitbit long enough that I could actually tell now almost to within 10 steps how many steps I've walked because I was kind of trained by that data. And so I don't really need the step counter because I can feel it. And mm -hmm. the same thing with um, some kind of a, some sleep apps and stuff. I can tell. Were you able to learn to feel what your glucose was um, from this data and, and observing and how you felt? Yes, it was really interesting. Um, I was really interested in these kind of um, late morning hunger attacks that I was having. And I always as assumed that, okay, I must have low blood sugar, right? Because I'm like driven to like eat something right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's, let's, yeah. But what I learned from measuring my blood sugar was that actually these were not occurring at the low blood sugar times. Huh. They were occurring at the times of fast descent in blood sugar after having uh -huh. a peak. Uh -huh. So it turned out that what I was feeling, my sensation of like really needing sugar was being triggered somehow by the slope of the curve, right? By yeah. somehow by like the, the, the decline. Mm. And so this, I mean, of course you can read this on any, you know, blog about nutrition advice. But for me, it was very useful to kind of see it and to notice that, wow, if I could just keep from having the big spike, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have the big hunger attack. I certainly yeah. didn't need to learn that more than once, right? Okay. Like once I learned that, I could easily tell, like, right, okay, right. Now, I'm, now I have this kind of thing going on. And also what was really interesting is I found that I could interrupt that craving right, right, right. with actually just a little bit of sugar. So I'm not against, you know, sugar, like on a religious, I don't have a religious objection to sugar right, right, or something. Right, right. So it's a tool. Just, it's a tool. <laughs> it's a tool. Exactly. So I, I could just eat like a little piece of candy, right? Like yeah, a little yeah, yeah. caramel or something like that. And then that craving would be gone. Right, right. That's really fa fabulous. Uh, so, so this is, I mean, this is really a very profound idea that, that you're kind of, um, well, a lot of the quantified selfing is not like you're going to be monitoring yourself in all dimensions always. It's more like uh, training yourself to to use your other senses or your natural body senses to do that observation. But you need the technology to kind of, you know, as you said, to train you. In some yeah. Way. So every once in a while, I would have these big. So, this, so we're seeing a graph now for those who are listening. Here's a graph. Um, uh, with, with a kind of a going along and a kind of a large peak in the center. Go exactly. Ahead. So you're seeing a blood sugar spike from 63 to 168 over the course of about two hours. And then right back down to 72, you know, about, you know, a little more than two hours later. So it's a very, sm you know, smooth and well-defined like leap in blood sugar. And what's very interesting about it is that it's between 11 p.m. at night and 4 a.m. in the morning when there's no food being eaten. Huh. Wow. And this happened on several nights. Wow. That is strange. It's very strange. And now there's various theories about why that could have happened. Like and this instance, happens to other people, too. Is that the idea? I ha I, I've heard a few cases, uh -huh. but I, I think it's very mysterious. Now, there's a mechanical explanation. Some people have said, well, you know, it's possible you just rolled over onto the sensor and somehow. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's possible. It's possible. However, it's really quite a smooth, mm. you know, like yeah. it, it resembles a lot of other blood sugar curves that go up, you know, pretty steeply uh -huh, after eating uh -huh. and then and then fall back to a baseline level. Right, right. So it doesn't look funny, but if it's it's completely unresolved. So anyway, this is my next uh, question: Is right, like, right, right, right. what 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 would cause extreme blood sugar spikes at night? Right, right. Um, it and, could and, be, and, for instance, um, sleep apnea. Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible. So that's another value of this idea of quantum, of measuring yourself is that um, we realize that 
we don't know anything really. And, and that so much of what we do know is only made from these occasional measurements. And that once you start to measure something on a kind of continuous or you know an un, uninterrupted basis, there is just so much we don't know. And that um, we're learning from doing this and we're learning to ask the questions. And in particular, some of is about ourselves too, to, which makes it even more interesting. Yeah, exactly. And also like one of the things you mentioned earlier was, well, you know, you use the technology to kind of um, train yourself to be aware mm -hmm. of certain things that otherwise would be unnoticeable to you. And, uh, you know, in that way, it resembles any kind of learning process. Like there's no reason to learn the same thing again and again, right? right like right. if you're learning a language, you don't stay, you don't just continue to do the drills that you did right, right. at the beginning. So I think this is something where quantified self and kind of the wearables industry to some extent has gone in separate directions because the wearables industry, of course, it wants and needs people to just do the same thing again and again and just, you know, upgrade and kind of continue to be monitored, you know, by, by the devices they're making. Mm -hmm. But, and, and this idea that people use them for a while and then leave them in a drawer, that's a, a big problem if that you're right, dependent right, right. on monthly subscriptions for right, right. a device. But from our perspective, it's not such a big problem. Like if you learn something right, right. and then you move on to something else, that actually is how we use a lot of tools, right? Like, right, right. Um, so, so that was a big discovery for us, I think. And, and even today, I continue to encounter people who think that the magic lies in just getting a bunch of monitoring onto your body mm -hmm. and then sending it out to the cloud and having an AI kind of mm -hmm. look at it and then kind of send you messages back to tell you about yourself. Mm -hmm. And Perhaps that's something that will happen, but yeah. right now there's a totally other thing happening, which is that we're using it ourselves to kind of answer our own questions, you right. know, and, and it, it's just a very fascinating process. Right, right. So that's fabulous. So Gary, what's a second um, cool tool? The, what I want to show now is a tool that I just started to use and I'm absolutely fascinated by. I've been following this person for a long time the person who made the tool, his name is Marco Altini. And I just ran my first half marathon. I celebrated my 60th birthday with a half marathon. And so I'm doing fitness training in a way that I've never done before. And maybe I'll celebrate my 61st with a full marathon if I can get there. And Marco makes a tool called HRV for training. And HRV stands for heart rate variability. And it's been known since the at least 1980s that you can use heart rate to predict your training response and your vulnerability to injury. So um, that's what I'm experimenting with right now. What's the variability part? So your heart rate is expressed in beats per minute. So that's your pulse, but it varies and it speeds up when you inhale and it slows down when you exhale. And heart rate variability, having kind of a nice smooth um, rise and fall in your heart rate uh, associated with your breath is a sign of being uh, in good shape. Mm. And if you're not in good shape, what's the, what's the, well, curve? what happens is under stress, your body tends to even out the heart rate. Oh, it does not have the variability. Exactly. Because like, let's imagine you're running away from a lion or something like that. You know, you want to have that heart rate just, you know, very, you know, regular and kind of hitting, um, you know, like the drum to drive you as far and as fast as possible, you know, as you exit the scene. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, when you're relaxed, you, um, that heart rate rises and falls. The science is really interesting because actually there's like a whole really important connection between your heart, the nerves that control your heart and the, um, and your brain basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, your, 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 um, nervous system, if, if you didn't have inhibition of your heart rate, if you just take the heart out of the body or heart cells, it beats really fast. Mm. So actually you have circuits in your nervous system that slow your heart. And the kind of functioning of that slowing 
that inhibition mm. is related to kind of your um, your um, kind of it's even hard to put the right word on it because it's but your overall kind of well being, mm -hmm. your health, your health. So um, okay, so 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 this is a device. I mean that measures your not just your heartbeat because they I mean your Fitbit will an advanced Fitbit will do that right. It can take your pulse. But this is measuring something else. This is measuring. Yeah, so this is where it becomes really interesting and why I'm fascinated by it. Measuring heart rate or pulse is that's where we started, Kevin, you know, right. 14 years ago, right? Like, um, so measuring heart rate variability is much more challenging because it's a more sensitive measure. And, you know, you really are looking at every single beat. So if you make a mistake in there, right, you're going to mess up the whole equation. So many of the most advanced wearables have tried to give really good HRV measurement and they're getting there. So the Apple Watch measure is getting there and they function well or poorly under different circumstances, right? Like how much you're moving and, you know, whether, you know, your watch is correctly fitted. <laughs> There's lots of things that create noise. Marco though, has been focused on something different not on refining the technical capacity. You mean the sensors. The device, not on refining the sensors, but on really understanding the context of measurement. Like mm. when do you measure? How do you measure? And then what does that measurement mean? Mm. Because he's a, a you know, um, performance fitness coach and has been mm. for many, many years. And so his tool allows you to measure your heart rate variability just using the camera on your iPhone. Oh, so wow. I've now got my finger over the, um, over the flashlight. And if I can, I'll just show you. Wow. That it's taking, now I'm standing up and causing a lot of stress on this device. So it, it thinks that I'm, my heart rate I, is beating very fast, but that's really just noise. Normally you do it sitting down and that's part of the um, magic here. Uh -huh. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to measure it out of sight where I can set my finger down on the table. Really. Um, calmly. So this isn't, this isn't I or a phone app. It's an iPhone app. It's, there's an Android both version. Both the light and the camera in your phone. And um, it's mostly for not while you're actually doing exercise because That'd be hard to do, but it's like at your, in your rest state. Exactly. And so Marco has a beautiful guide to heart rate variability that he's published, which explains, and he has really excellent data showing he, this method in comparison with much more sophisticated, technically sophisticated methods of getting heart rate variability and showing that you can get the signal that you need for your training by controlling the measurement context. So you do it the same time every day. You do it mm. for just 60 seconds. You do it sitting in the same way every time. And you get a really good measurement that you can then use to guide your training. And of course, at my age, and for athletes who aim at you know extreme performance, which I never did, but even at a younger age, um, what you're concerned about in training is injury. Like right. once you get to the point where you're enjoying your training, you just you don't want to be thrown off by an injury. So HRV is one of the things that allows you to kind of test your recovery mm, so that you don't get injured. And this is being used extensively in professional sports. It's right, you know right. every single training room is doing measurements right. like this, but it's become now something that you know you just can do with your phone. I also really appreciate the learning process. Mm. So you know it takes some thinking to use this measurement. But the thinking is really interesting thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the thinking that kind of puts you more in touch with mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. own body and, and your own mind. Well, that's fabulous. Well, and, and again, what's the name of the app? It's called HRV number four uh -huh. training. HRV, HRV for, for training. training. Okay. Yeah. I'll send you well, a link, of course. You can put it in the show notes. Do you have any idea how much it costs? Yes, I did buy it, so I've forgotten now, but I think I spent something like $10 for it. Okay, all right. So if you think about it, like I used to have a polar strap and it, you know, I used to have another app that tried, where I tried to kind of, anyway, it's yeah. 
It's a pretty cool. extreme advance. And, you know, I'll tell you a funny story that um, one of my colleagues, Thomas Christensen, told me the other day because we were talking about how that the capacity to do really good observations changed science so much in the mm -hmm. 16th century, right? Like they mm -hmm. were all about like microscopes and telescopes. And, mm -hmm. and he was telling me that the great Dan Danish, you know, astronomer Tycho Brahe had a distributed sensor network that consisted of multiple assistants in different rooms looking out windows. <laughs> and then he was yelling the times so that they could kind of count down and make the observations at exactly the same time. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, you know what? That was very advanced right, for that right, moment. Right, like right. recognizing that like um, it, it, if you can kind of get your method of observation right, you can make yeah. a gigantic leap in what you can know about. So no Tycho Brahe, no Kepler, you know, no Kepler, no Newton, you know. So. Right, right. So I think that even like somebody like Marco Altini, it seems pretty geeky, like, okay, how do you get heart rate variability with an iPhone mm -hmm. camera? He's in that tradition. He's in that scientific tradition yeah. and we're, we're gonna learn a lot. That's fabulous. Thank you. So Gary, what's your third um, tool? Okay, so, you know, this could be taken as um, a bit promotional, but I just say that like, this is not something that we make any money on. It's just something that we do to um, support the community, but it was a big discovery for us. And that is that one of the, the missing ingredient for learning about your own data is not um, only what tool you use to make the observation, but it's where you can get the support and the help and find the colleagues in a sense that you need to do the learning that you wanna do. And so I wanted to show the Quantified Self Forum. It's a free forum. Kevin is somebody who's done a lot of online <laughs> gardening. You know that like maintaining a social space for super high quality questions and answers is a triumph. So I'm very proud of this. And this is our community forum. It's at forumquantifiedself.com. And as you can see, people are asking pretty hard questions here. Like, oh, I exported my data from, from two different times from Apple and I got two different results. Why, why did that happen? Or how can I track my body temperature more accurately? Or, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a dashboard of all my data together. Um, and, you know, it's my job basically to um, moderate. And if you have a question about self-tracking that we didn't answer today in this really short conversation, this is the place to get it answered. Wow. That's a, you should get a, you should be a, a national treasure badge for moderating <laughs> this kind of a conference because my experience is that the quality of the conversation is directly proportional to the quality of the moderation. It's just, there's just no, there's no exceptions, really. Thank you. Well, you know, I go back a long way, not quite as far as you in this particular, you know, domain of expertise, mm -hmm. but I do go back pretty far. And I have to say, I enjoy it a lot. I mean, even like there is, I do vaporize a lot of spam, but it's like a little video game, you know? So when I clear it all out and it's all just high quality signal, I kind of, it's a very easy win for me. Like I feel very happy. Yeah. Well, that's really great. So we'll point to um, people with the uh, show notes, but it's, it's at the quantified forum at the quantified self. Yeah. Forum.quantifiedself.com. And, and it's, it's um, I keep doing it because the quality of the people who respond there uh -huh. and the knowledge that they have, I just think it's remarkable and inspiring. Right. Gary, I liked to, um, have you talked about your newest project in the few minutes we have remaining? Okay, sure. Um, so we just came out with a book and I say me, we, because although I wrote the book, you know, in terms of putting the text onto the page, it expresses the ideas of a core group of quantified self experts. Um, so I have uh, five co-authors and it's called Personal Science, Learning to Observe. Pers personal or personalized? Personal personal. science. Personal science. You have a cover to... Yeah, uh, yeah I have just a... We have so far published it on LeanPub. We've done a kind of community pre-publication. You know, it will get a normal publication sometime when we're ready. Um, but um, 
LeanPub is a wonderful web service for authors where they can pre-release their drafts to the community on a pay as you wish basis. And is this is this like an ebook or is this yes. like a So this is an ebook it has a PDF it has, uh, you know uh, LeanPub makes it available in all the different ebook formats. Kindle? Um yes. Okay. Yep, you can get it in all the ebook formats and also if you buy it on LeanPub then you get access to the final version when it's ready and you can give some feedback. I'd say we're about 80% done. Okay. And what has happened with this book, what we've done with this book is, as you know, the quantified self knowledge sharing method was really to have meetings. And we had meetings all over the world. I mean, there were over 100 cities in 30 countries that had quantified self meetings in them and then conferences every year. But the pandemic really put an end to that. I would say you've had thousands of meetups at this point, right? 10,000 yeah, maybe? Mean, or there's worldwide? Really, there's re- they're really uncountable, but, you know, we did try to count them at one point. And, um, you know, I think they're, they're, there's probably over a thousand individual separate events of some kind or another, okay. you know, um, but they range from like five people around a table at a university to 2000 people, you know, in the San Francisco waterfront, you know, so right. it was a very freewheeling free for all, right. you know, and that's been 15 years. The first one was in 2008. So um, you and I did our first blog post in 2007. The first right. meeting was in 2008. Right. And so, so, so almost 15 years, yeah. right? So, so, like, so the question would be, what have you learned in 15 years? And this is Correct. sort of an answer. This is the first answer. This is really an attempt in, to put into a readable, really direct way every key piece of wisdom that we've learned about self-tracking. And some of it is really counterintuitive and it's meant to support people who are really at that stage of their journey where they want to begin. It's not trying to convince anybody like you should try okay. this or, you know, why don't you think about observing? It's, it's if you are at that point where you want to make your own observations to answer your own questions, sure. how can you do it? What would be an example of a counterintuitive um, lesson? Well, one of the most important lessons is it's not about the technology. Sure. It's about how you refine the question you're going to ask Mm -hmm. and how you represent that question in a, in a way that allows you to track something. So what is the phenomenon? What is the thing that you want to keep track of that could shed some light on the question you have? Mm -hmm. Now you might start out by saying, okay, I have headaches. I'm going to just track and rate my headaches. But we've learned a lot about that. Like, for instance, we've learned that that's probably too hard because you want to have your data last. You want to have tracking data that lasts you for months at least because you want to see the rise and fall. Mm -hmm. Every day you're going to say every time you have a headache, how bad is this headache? We know already that those projects have been tried hundreds and hundreds of times and mostly they fail. There are other because they fail. They fail because there's a little bit of friction in doing that. Is my headache a three or a four? Do I have a pencil with me? Can I pull my phone out of my pocket right now at this moment? Mm -hmm. It's just a little friction. You can get over that friction once. You can get over it five times, Mm -hmm. but you can't get over it 500 times Mm -hmm. and get the data that you want. And it fails like some people, it fails like after a day, some people it fails after a week. (laughs) But for the most part, and some people are very special and have that like intense mentality yeah. where they're, they're not going to let it fail. Right. Um, they're going to stop dinner and like pull out their phone and say, okay, everybody, I've got a, I've got a bit of a headache now, <laughs> but there are other ways to do it, which will be just as good. And mm. that's kind of what we describe in the book is how to, how to get, make your questions truly answerable so that you don't run into a roadblock and you don't have to take two years to learn how to do this. Um, mm-hmm. But you can start with the knowledge that people have already gathered over the last 15 I years. I look forward to that. That sounds fantastic, just what it's needed. Um, because I'm often asked that question and I don't yep. have really, haven't had a good answer about how do I start? What, what should I look out for? What should I not do? What should I track? Right. What tools should I buy? We start from the beginning and we tell you, how right. do you pose the question and how do you right. choose what to track and then what tool is best? And so that, um, edition of your book is now available now. It's not the final one, but people can get it and even participate in, so to speak, in the completion of it. Absolutely. Yes. And, and we're really 
sensitive at this stage to the feedback that we get. So if you have an interest, this is really, this edition is for people who think that they have an interest in this topic, right? right and, right. you know, if you have an interest in making your own knowledge with your own data, read this draft. And, you know, if you have something to say, we'll listen. And in addition to that, there's the forum. And the forum is the forum is the place for the stuff that isn't in the book, right? Like in the book, we're not going to tell you why did this export from <laughs> Apple Health fail, right? Yeah, yeah. But people need to know that, right? But that's that's for the forum, and, right, right, and if right. you're really in there in the weeds, okay. the forum is for you. Well, this has been perfect, Gary. Thank you so much. It's been we've long overdue for catch up. Um, I think you're doing fabulous work there at the Quantified Self. Um, and I think the two things, particularly this book, is exactly what's needed right now. So I'm so delighted you're working on it. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much for doing this and for everything that you kind of have done <laughs> over the years to make this uh, from, a, from a, a, a glimmer of an idea to an actually thriving community. Right. It was really great. So thanks for the cool tool suggestions. And we'll see you all next week. We're glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this Cool Tools Show and Tell is also available in an Audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts if you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel where we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us, uh, the Cool Tools website out, we also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website, um, and they are also free. And finally, um, I want to mention the fact that um, we do have a Patreon, and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month. And for that, you get um, an email to ask us anything. We'll respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page. And all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan. And um, we'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. We want to thank this week's patrons, who include Bruce Allen Horn, Wayne Willis, Riga, Roland Wilkerson, Patrick Weir, Nate McCoy, David Pell, Randall Bundy, Stephen Kasapi, and Phil King. Thank you all. We appreciate your support. <laughs>